Let's pray together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that we can know love and experience love and we can share love because you first loved us. And so now as we open your word here in these next few moments, Lord, use it to speak truth into our hearts that it would transform us into the likeness of Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray this morning. Amen. What if, what if you were getting out of your car this morning to come in to worship here at the church and when you got to the door of the church, there was somebody that greeted you and they said, hey man, no strings attached, but I want to give you today a check for $25,000. Wow. And then they said, not only that, after church is over, I want to take you out for a steak. We're going to go to have lunch. And when we sit there, I just want to like, get to know you. I want to hear your story. I want to spend time and listen to you. And then I want to encourage you and build you up. And then not only that, after lunch, I want to go to your house and you just put your feet up and I'm going to get in your driveway. I'm going to wash your car and vacuum it out for you. And then before I leave, I'm going to come, I'm going to give you a big hug. Wow. Wouldn't that be cool? Like my wife would say, best day ever. Like, <laughs> wouldn't you feel the love there? A few years ago, uh, author Gary Chapman wrote a book called The Five Love Languages. You probably are familiar with it. And he talked about how there's ways that we each have a language that, that we can experience love. And I, it might be we get a gift or we spend quality time together or, or somebody uh, does an act of service for us or, or builds us up or, or even gives us physical affection, love. And so we are launching into a brand new series called Love is a Verb. Love, what, what is it? It's, a, it's such a complicated word, love. I love that the, the maker of the Peanuts cartoon, Charles Schultz, he says this, all you need is love, but a little chocolate now and then doesn't hurt. Love. It's a, it's a complicated word that can be used in, in various ways in our language. And so I want to give you just a little bit of a, a grammar thing, but don't worry, there's not a test here. But if I were to say God is love, like what part of speech would, the, would love be there? God is love, it's, it would be a noun. But then I can use it as an, as an adjective that Jane lovingly prepared a, a lunch for us. Or I can use it as an adjective, like my grandmother is a loving woman. But how about this, when Jesus looks at us and he says, I want you to love the least of these among you. What is he saying? How is he using it? He says, I want you to, to go and do. And love is a verb. He's calling us into action. Love does. I want us to get this point straight right off the bat, though, that here's the truth, that, that there's nothing more that you can do to earn the favor of your heavenly Father, for Christ has already done it for you on the cross for your salvation. It's not, when we do, we're not saying, God, watch me and, and see if I can impress you, because he says, no, I already love you. I can't love you anymore. And so here's the, the truth that we need to grasp today, that, that I am in him, and so I do for others. You get it? That, that, that my doing is a byproduct of being his child and being in him. Love does. Love does. And so the challenge that we find in our lives, though, as we think about this, the problem that we often experience is that we see it. We say, I know I need to share love with people, but, you know, I'm so tired. I came home, and I'm just exhausted. I don't have any more to give, and I'm just, I'm caught up in my own stuff, or, or, or you know what, I'm, I've got a grudge against this person. How can I, like, show love to them? I don't even want to. Like, we, we battle these, these things inside of us, but we live in a, in a culture, in a world that so desperately needs some love right now. If you turn on the TV, you see it. Like, there's just all this, this, uh, arguing and these, this tone out there right now of divisiveness in the world. The world needs love, and God is calling us today as his church to put love into action. And in this series, what we're going to do, we're going to answer some questions. We're going to say, what does love require of me? And then each week, we're going to take and we're going to look at actions that Jesus actually taught. He taught his followers. He's teaching us some specific ways that we can Put love into action because love does. Love is a verb. And our goal in this series is that, that each week, that each one of us would go out and do loving things and bring the love of Christ to the world. 
Now, we're already doing that in a lot of ways and in our families, and, and you're doing a lot of things, but what I'm gonna call you to do is to ramp it up, to go even more, to find some new and different ways that you can bring the love of Christ into the world because love does. We're gonna see this today that, that love isn't primarily just something that you feel, it's something that you do. And the big idea I want you to walk away with today is this, that love is doing what's best for others no matter what it costs you. Think about it, I'm thinking about someone else, other, I'm getting outside of myself, I'm doing, and no matter what the cost is to me. A lot of people, when they think about love, they think about feelings. And don't they? It's like, oh, I'm falling in love. I have no choice. And it's like some enchanted evening. And I see my love across the room, and, and my heart's beating faster, and my palms are sweaty. And it's like I get those, those tingles, and, man, I'm infatuated, and I, I feel love. But the, the older we get, we, we begin to realize that, that there's more to it, that that. Over time, we see that love is, is actually more doing than just feeling because feelings are going to go like this, like the waves up and down, and, and, and love is the constant. It's a commitment. It's, it says, I'm going to stick with you through it, the, even the feelings that can go up and down. How do we know that love is a verb? Let's take a few moments to look at a couple of things, and the first one is this, is you can command action, not feelings. God commands us to love. He says, I want you to love me with all your heart and your mind and your soul and your strength. That's, he's saying, I want you to love me with all you got. And that's the first and greatest commandment. Then he said, the second commandment is, is similar, but he says this, I want you to love your neighbors as yourself. He's commanding love. He says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. He even says, I want you to love your your enemies. It's like, what? What is this even? How, how am I to do this? Look what he teaches us, Jesus, in Luke chapter 6, verse 27. It says, but to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. In the original language here, Jesus is actually giving us what's called some imperative commands. He's saying, do good, love others, pray for, and bless people, even people, that, that, that guy at work that gets on your nerves. Look at verse 36. He says, but love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. If we were to look at both of these texts here, what, what, after, what are the first two words that we run across after he says, love your enemies? Take a look at it. He says, do good. That's how we, we show them how much we love them. But Jesus, I don't feel the love over here for my enemy. He's like, actually on my nerves. He's like, I'm not asking you to feel. I'm asking you to go over here and put love in action. And I want you to show my love to him through your action. Wow, he's calling us into to put love in, to make it a verb, and he's commanding us to love. You can command action, you can't command a feeling. Imagine this, you've got a, a young child, an elementary kid, a student, and they come home from school, and man, they've had a tough day up there. It's like on the playground, they were getting bullied, everybody's making fun of them, they, they come home all dejected and just sit down in the living room all sad, and you walk up and you go, hey, be happy, be elated. They would look at you with confusion like, what? Like you can't just command someone to just be happy. You can command an action though. You can say, hey, get up and go to your room and pick it up. See what I'm saying? Like you can command them to do something. And so God is saying, I'm commanding you to go out and live out love. I'm calling you. And we also, in some time, we get confused and we say, wait a second, isn't what about love and feelings? How does all that work? Isn't there, because I do feel some feelings in love, but generally our feelings, our emotions are in a response to some stimuli out here that's outside of us, or maybe there's some, some things going on, churning in our mind that causes us to feel emotion. Let me give you an example. 
Let's say it's been raining and it's cloudy for like five straight days and you've been stuck it in the house and you're just like, ugh. And then all of a sudden, man, one day the, the sun comes out and it's warm and you step out and you feel it and you go, ah, and you just smile and you go, man, I feel happy. It's the stimulus outside that has it's caused my emotions to, to respond and I feel better. How about after church, man, you're like really hungry? Like I'm heading up to Rose's over here to get some Mexican food. Man, if you've been there, you get out of the car, you smell those fajitas, man, that, oh, that meat, I cannot wait. You get in there, you get up to the line, it's like a long line, you get there, and I'll take the fajitas, and they go, I'm sorry, sir, we just gave out the last order, there's no more left. You'd be like, what? Like, this is the thing, you're angry, and you're hungry, and it's like this new word I heard recently, I'm hangry. Maybe you've been there, I'm like, hey, uh, I'm hangry. You're feeling this emotion from an outside stimulus, but... God is saying that I want you to love, that love is not just a feeling, it's a, a doing, it's a verb. Did you know this, that you can actually change the way you feel about someone by changing your behavior toward it, by doing good for someone? Psychologists call this, this concept, act your way into feeling. You might have heard this before, act your way into feeling. There was a a married couple that was, had been together for quite a while and they were having some, some rough times. They were like, uh, at each other's throats all the time and this lady, she goes into her, to a counselor and she's like, I cannot stand this guy anymore. Oh, I just, I want out of here. But not only do I want to divorce him, I want to like, I want to just uh, hurt him, really. I just stick it to him because he's been so bad to me. And the counselor thought for a minute, he came up with the strategy. He said, all right, I want you to try this. I want you to go home, and, and I want you to like, start loving your husband and doing loving things. Like go in the kitchen, make him something, bring him like, some tea in there, and I like, just say, you know, just give him some encouragement, and maybe even like, hug him. And then, man, like, he's going to really feel this love. And then like, after two months of doing this, you can just pull the rug out from under him and say, I want a divorce, and that's really going to hurt him. And she's like, beautiful, beautiful, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. So she goes home and she starts doing that. And two months go by and the counselor never hears from her. He calls her up one day like, hey, when's the divorce? And she's like, divorce? Like, what are you talking about? I love this man now. Like, I went home and I did what you said. And I realized how much I really did care about him, how much I did love him. And, and slowly, one day at a time, it, it began to come back. And, and, and I realized what a blessing he is in my life. We can act our way into feeling. Maybe you're, you're feeling a bankruptcy right now in your life and your marriage, and they he, God's calling you to, to put love into action and to begin doing. Make love a verb, and you're going to be amazed at what God might be doing to rekindle some things in your life. Because here's the truth today, that love is a choice to stay when you could leave. Love is a choice to be kind, even when you could do great harm to someone else. The second thing we're gonna learn today about love is this, that the Bible treats love as something that you do. When Jesus was in his ministry, he was teaching, his, and large crowds were gathering. He was up in the northern part of Israel around the, the Sea of Galilee. It's a beautiful body of water up there, and there's green mountains around there. We were over there recently. It's just stunning to see and visualize and to think Jesus was there. And he's out and large crowds were gathering. And one of the most famous passages of scripture in the, the word of God is, is in the book of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount. And I want you to hear just a little about what Jesus was teaching as he was there. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they think about it and they just ponder what they can do. No, he says that they put it on a stand, they take action, and it gives light to everyone in the house. And so in the same way, Jesus says, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and give you all the credit and build you up. No, it's that they might see your good deeds and glorify who? Your Father in heaven. It's that they see you sharing the love and it brings glory to God. They will know we are Christians. Why? By our love. 
They see your life, and it brings glory to your Father in heaven. This little light of mine, remember that song? Like, hide it under a bushel. No! Like, we used to sing that all the time. He's saying, here's the truth, church, that it's not just a little light. You're not just a little light. He says, you are the light of the world. And as you go out, you're going to be bringing the light into the darkness of the world around you that so desperately needs love. Don't just talk about it. It's time to put love into action. Love does. Listen to what Paul teaches us in the book of Romans chapter 13. He says, let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, not murder, not steal, not covet. And what other commands there may be are all summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then look at verse 10 right here. He says, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Love does no harm to a a neighbor. And that's the, like a negative way to say it, but if we were to spin it to the positive, it would be like love does positive and good and does, th- excuse me, things for your neighbor. Love does and shows by helping people. Love gets out of ourselves and out of our little bubble and it begins to cause our eyes to, to go out and to see needs around us. Imagine this, like you're going through something and a friend says, hey, let's go grab a bite of lunch. So you go out and you're sitting there and they say, hey, where are you? You go, what, I'm right here. Like, what are you talking about? No, like, where are you like here and and, and in here? And what love does is love listens. Love zeroes in and, and gets out of self and says, I'm showing compassion and I'm giving you my time and my encouragement and I'm getting out of myself. Love does for other people. Listen to what 1 John chapter 3 says. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with what? With, with actions and in truth. Wow, not just saying it. Words are easy to to say, but he says, I want you to put it into action for love is doing what is best for others, no matter what it's going to cost me. And so today we say, where do I draw my cues for love? Like, what's my basis? Like, I don't know. How do, like, do I look at the the, the movies over here and to try to and like, and look at relationships that I see played out over here? No. Or what about the music, like country music and all this? And like, is this where I'm getting my cues for love? And he said, no. Like, Jesus says, I want you to come and follow me. I'm going to set an example. The last thing that we're going to learn today is that Jesus is the example of love. If you've ever had a moment of doubt where you Say, how could God love me? Does my heavenly father care about me? Have I gone too far? Have I strayed away so far that I've outrun the love of God? Your heavenly father says, today I want you to cast your eyes up here. I want you to look to Calvary and I want you to look at the cross and I want you to hear today one of the most beautiful verses in all of scripture. We can never hear it too many times. It's Romans 5, 8 and it says this right here. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, your heavenly father didn't just say, hey, I love you. He goes, I'm gonna put it into action. I'm gonna show you. And and not even after you've cleaned yourself up and gotten your act together, I'm going while you were still in your sin, and I'm gonna go, and I'm gonna demonstrate what love looks like on the cross. Look what 1 John chapter 4 says says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And so he finishes, dear friends, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. Jesus, the example of love, he goes to lay down his life because he wants to give his best no matter what's gonna cost him and it costs him everything. The most incredible example of perfect love. I wanna call you to action 
this week to do something that I'm calling today flood the love. Flood the love. And you, what is this? There's so many different ways we can love on people. And I made this list just to kind of prime the pump to get you thinking. And maybe you want to jot down some ideas. How about this call or text someone? Have you ever been like you're driving and you get like a little thought like, I, I wonder how so-and-so is. And, and it could be that maybe God's prompting you to reach out that this person has a need. Or, and so today, instead of just ignoring that and saying, ah, whatever, like I want to encourage you this week to be sensitive to that and to pick up the phone or send them a a text. The next thing, write a card or a note. This is kind of a lost art now, the handwritten card. Like, what is this? Like, uh. But man, can, like, when you get one, how incredible. It's like you open it up and someone has taken the time to sit down and, and they handwrite a note. Maybe you can be the one that's going to be sharing the love. Spend qu some quality time this week with your spouse, with your, your children. Say, I'm gonna, we're gonna set aside intentional time to show the love. How about this listen? I put this one in for myself. Listen without cutting in. <laughs> like, I'm always like, hey, I gotta, like, here's what you should do, or like, uh, and I, uh, no. How about we show the love? By, mm, we zip it up a little bit, and we just listen for a minute. Take a meal or buy a meal. Maybe there's somebody in your work that's lost a loved one or in the hospital and they're having surgery and you can, you can show the love by taking a meal or maybe you're in a restaurant and you see somebody across the way and you just pick up their ticket, whatever that might look like to show the love, to flood the love. How about this, offer to pray for somebody. That's an incredible, inexpensive way you can show some incredible love to someone. When I was in the cafe in between services, I just saw two ladies that, that are here in our church and, and they were just praying together. And I thought, man, that's so great. It's just that we have an attitude of prayer here. Offer to pray, share the love, flood the love. And the last one is this. Look for Jesus disguised as hurting people around us this week. He says, if you do it unto the least of these, you're, you've done it unto me. So can you open your spiritual eyes this week? I challenge you to go and look for Jesus in hurting people in the least of these. Ted Stollard was one of the least of these. He was a young student who was disheveled and his clothes were all wrinkled up and he, he was expressionless and unattractive. And even his teacher in school, Miss Thompson, loved to get out a red pen and mark up and X all of his wrong answers. She might have treated him a little differently if she would have gotten out his files and read the backstory on this young man. For the note from first grade said this, Ted shows promise with his work and his attitude, but he has a poor home situation. Second grade it said this, Ted could do better. His mother is seriously ill and he receives little help from home. The third grade note in the file said, Ted's a good boy, but he's a little serious. He's a slow learner. A slow learner. His mother died this year. In fourth grade, it says, Ted's slow, but he's well behaved, but his father shows no interest in him whatsoever. Christmas time rolled around, and all the kids were, were bringing presents to Miss Thompson, and they were bringing these nice wrapped presents with bows on them. Well, Ted shows up at school one day with his gift wrapped in brown paper sack with some scotch tape on it. He set it on the desk and Miss Thompson called all the kids around and they gathered around and she began to open them and finally it came to Ted's gift and she opens it and out fell this, this broken looking bracelet that had half the rhinestones missing and a, a cheap bottle of perfume that was half empty. The kids all were snickering and making fun of Ted but she silenced them and she took the perfume and sprayed it and let all the kids smell it. After class was over, all the kids filed out, and Ted was the last one, and he came by the desk, and he said, thank you, Miss Thompson. I hope you, you like my present. That bracelet sure looks nice on you, and you smell like my mother. He left. She got on her knees by her desk, and she said, Father, forgive me. Forgive me for my attitude. And the next day when the kids showed up at class, they found a brand new Miss Thompson. She was setting her heart on love, and I'm going to look out for the least of these among us, among us. It's 
not surprising that, 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 or maybe it is, that Ted, he began to do better. He was beginning to improve in his studies, and he was actually passing other kids in his, his classes as there was a new attitude of love, and, and he went on to leave, and, and she didn't hear from him for years, and then later she got a letter at the school. It said, Dear Miss Thompson, I want you to be the first to know I will be graduating second in my class, love Ted. She was so happy. Four years later, another letter arrived at the school and she read it and it said, Dear Miss Thompson, they, they told me that I will be graduating first in my class and I wanted you to be the first to know. College wasn't easy, but I sure enjoyed it. Love, Ted. About four years later, another letter showed up. She tore into it and it said, Dear Miss Thompson, as of today, I am Theodore Stollard, M.D., how about that? I wanted you to be the, the first to know, and, and I'm getting married next month on the, the 27th. I want you to come and, and to sit where my mother would have sat. You were the only family I have now. My dad died last year. Miss Thompson attended that wedding, and she sat where Ted's mother would have sat, and the, she earned that spot from the compassion that she showed and the love that she showed to the least of these. And so church, I'm calling you today. All across this room, imagine if we were to go out with courage and begin to, to show the love and to begin to live out the love of Christ, to make love a verb. Love does. It's time. It's time for us to go and flood the love. To flood the love, church. In Jesus' name, let's go out this week and let's flood the love to his glory. In the name of Jesus, amen.